I'm going to turn it over to uh, Frederick Branding, who's the principal attorney with Olson, Frank, and Rita. Um, lots of experience in, in this matter. Um, I'm not going to read his bio, but uh, his bio is included in your packet of materials. So please uh, do take a moment to read over uh, his accomplishments. Uh, they are impressive. So with uh, Brad, I'm going to pass it over to you. Appreciate it. Um, we have a lot of material to cover, and um, we'll probably take a break, as we mentioned before we started, um, approximately halfway through. Uh, my idea, my goal is to get through the slides and any discussion that we have with those slides. And I <clears throat> would encourage you to ask questions. Raise your hands. We have a young lady with a microphone back there that will uh, pick up your questions so everyone can hear them. And I suspect that you all have experience in the inspectional area of interfacing with the Food and Drug Administration. And my theory is that our combined experience uh, is certainly more than any one person. So I would encourage you, please, to share your experiences uh, as they come up uh, or ask questions, certainly, as they come up. And there might be other people here in the room um, that can share their information and their experiences as well. Just a real quick question. Who has had experience with FDA inspection? Excellent. So we have a wonderful class. This is great. This is great. A lot of experience. Good. Well, let's get started and uh, talk about a little bit of the, the general principles. Um, you probably already know this. Uh, the reasons that FDA uh, conducts <clears throat> what, it's called, what are called administrative inspections. They've got the routine inspections that they conduct uh, for drugs and devices. Historically, it's been once every two years, at least once in a two-year period, the biennial inspection that FDA is well known for. There are also four cause, sometimes called directed inspections. They may come from the district office, uh, where the investigators are uh, officed, uh, or they may come from headquarters. There may be a specific reason why one of the centers is interested in having more information about a particular facility. FDA also inspects uh, for follow-ups to uh, enforcement actions, seizures, injunctions, criminal prosecutions, um, warning letters, to make sure that the commitments that are made and the responses to the warning letters, or even the 483s for that matter, uh, have been completed as they have been reported to uh, FDA. Complaints from consumer, industry, trade complaints, um, and even current or former employees are something that FDA takes very seriously, particularly complaints from current or former employees uh, with regard to the operation of the manufacturing uh, procedures at a particular facility. Recall effectiveness check, not necessarily a guarantee. Uh, that there will be an inspection if there's a recall, but sometimes there is to make certain that the products that need to be recalled have in fact been recalled uh, and they have been properly disposed of uh, after their recall. Pre-approval inspection, prior to the 90s, early 1990s, there was no such thing as a pre-approval inspection. Pre-approval inspections, as we'll go into a few slides following here, uh, originated after the generic drug scandal that period of time, late 1980s, early 1990s. And then sometimes FDA has special enforcement initiatives. Um, I remember when I was an assistant U.S. attorney and represented the Food and Drug Administration in federal court, there were a couple of times where the local district office had a special food sanitation, if you will, uh, initiative where they were focusing on food warehouses in the Chicago area, instituting seizure action against these uh, dirty warehouses. Okay, pre-approval inspection. Before an, an application can be approved by FDA, FDA has to be comfortable with and assured that the operations are such that they will ensure the identity, strength, quality, and purity of the drugs that have been off on the GMPs. That's straight out of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, Section 505. Uh, in the pre-approval inspections, their on-site objectives are to make sure that the facility is ready for commercial operation, that it has the proper equipment 
scale up. Um, and again, to go back and mention again, the generic drug scandal, before the early 1990s, there was no such thing as a pre-approval inspection. This all happened because during the process of submitting and receiving approval for applications in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, there were less than truthful applications that were submitted. So the pre-approval inspections resulted from that, and now um, they take place with varying degrees of intensity depending on the status of the firm. Um, these are some of the areas that are covered. Uh, data audits to assess the GMP compliance as well as batch records. Excipients, it's pretty much uh, head to toe kind of an inspection um, of the facility. And we don't need to spend a lot of time. This is in the materials, you can look at those. But here are some of the things that they do cover. Also raw materials, the container closure systems. This issue right here, the container closure systems, is not only important um, in a pre-approval inspection or a regular inspection. There have been recent recalls within this month of particulate matter in sterile injectable products. And in one case uh, that I've read about, is they believe that the source of the particulate matter in this injectable product came from the supplier of the glass vials that were used. So keep in mind, it's not just the APIs, the excipients, it's also the components of the drug products that FDA is interested in and will uh, inspect for. And again, product stability test methods, um, relevant pre-approval and validation of commercial production batches scale up. Back to the generic drug situation in the um, late 80s, early 90s, um, what was I wouldn't say it was necessarily common, but it was not uncommon that applicants would submit an application for an abbreviated new drug application, primarily. And in that application, they would report that they were capable of manufacturing a batch of, say, 2 million tablets, when in fact they'd only manufactured batches of 200 tablets. And the idea was to save money, get the approval, after the approval came in, then they could buy the equipment that they needed to manufacture the large scale and scale up. So that simple, quote, arithmetic didn't necessarily always work in a scale up situation. Go from, say, my crude example, 200 tablets to, say, 2 million tablets in a, in a batch. Again, still in the pre approval, but this is not necessarily limited to pre-approval inspections. It also will apply to regular standard inspections of varying degrees. The idea of these slides is to give you some, some idea of the general areas of the topic that may be covered, certainly in a pre-approval inspection, um, but also can be covered in a, uh, in a standard, if you will, drug inspection of a uh, manufacturing facility. Um, these are the types of things that probably would be more pertinent to a routine, if you will, um, food and drug uh, administrative inspection, inspection for GMP compliance. So how are they there? How are they, the they being the Food and Drug Administration? Um, Section 704 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act uh, specifically authorizes by statute for FDA investigators to be at the premises and to conduct an inspection. Uh, and this is a key word in the statute, reasonable. Reasonable time, reasonable limit, in a reasonable manner. Those are the words that are used in Section 704. It's the reasonable. So if a facility is not operating, say there's, there are only two shifts that operate during the day at a manufacturing site, would it be reasonable, he asked rhetorically, for an investigator to show up at midnight and wonder why the facility was not manufacturing products. No. That's a very basic example of how an investigator coming at that time and operation. Same, same thing if a facility is shut down for a pre-scheduled maintenance. It would not be reasonable for the investigator to expect that facility to be up and operating manufacturing so that they could observe it. Frequency of the inspections, 
I mentioned those were biennial for a long period of time. That's changed, and we'll, we'll discuss that a little a few slides forward from now, um, particularly with devices and with, um, with drugs, uh, given some am recent amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, a guidance document that uh, FDA has. has um, consent is unnecessary way long ago. Uh, there was a requirement that these types of inspections would require consent of the owner, operator, agent in charge. That's not necessary. Um, inspection warrants. Um, there are no warrants that are required for these types of inspections. There's, there's case law that establishes administrative agencies, including FDA, authority and in industries such as those that are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration to come in and to inspect the facilities pursuant to exercising their enforcing the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, but an inspection warrant is, of course, of a different color. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that basically is an order from the court. It's a judicial order issued typically by a federal magistrate judge ordering the facility that probably has refused the inspection prior to allow the inspection to go forward. And that is a significant event from an enforcement point of view and it's a significant event from an inspectional point of view. Uh, and it has broader ramifications, if you will, in, in the authority that's granted in Section 704. Um, Miranda warnings. We've all watched enough cops and robbers show on TV to know what Miranda warnings are. You have a right, I mean, you have a right to remain silent type of thing. Those types of warnings are offered to individuals that are under arrest who, whose liberty to leave has been restrained. Uh, this is not the situation here with the so Miranda warrant or Miranda warnings uh, are not required as well. Okay, what, what FDA is authorized to do and what FDA does sometimes are a little bit different. Um, affidavits are one thing that are not specifically authorized by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, FDA investigators on a regular basis uh, offer individuals at facilities, drug manufacturers, device manufacturers, food, vet med products, offer employees affidavits that they the investigators have prepared uh, and give them to the employees to sign. Recently had a case, uh, a criminal case, a criminal food and drug case. It did not involve drugs, it involved another regulated product. But this facility uh, was inspected by FDA over a couple of years. And during that period of time, the owner, operator, agent in charge was given an opportunity, was handed, prepared affidavits that were prepared by the investigator. That individual unwittingly signed those affidavits. Those affidavits later became part of the evidence against that person when the government brought formal criminal charges against that person. Basically, what had happened in those affidavit is affidavits, and there were half a dozen or so, is that person had admitted to violating the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And when the agency strung together those affidavits over a period of time, it showed land affidavits can also provide notice, just as a 483 provides notice. The individual was told on a particular date, admitted that um, there had been certain violations, was told again and admitted all in affidavit for about four or five times. So it makes it very, very difficult, well after the fact, to be able to counteract the information that's in those affidavits. Um, again, there's no requirement uh, to even read the affidavits. Some firms have policies uh, in the handling of affidavits. With the firms that you're with here, how many of your firms in your SOPs or your policies and procedures have a procedure that deals with handling of affidavits? That's a good number. It's something, if you don't have it, 
you might want to take it back and talk to your people um, at the, at the um, firm and see if there is some way that you should uh, develop some procedure, some practice um, with regard to the handling of affidavits. <clears throat> one of the, and this I believe is in the hypothetical, one of the techniques that investigators use sometimes if the person refuses to sign the affidavit, the investigator will sometimes say, well, just let me read it to you. And then they read the affidavit to them and they say, is that correct? And if the person responds that that's correct, then the investigator, little pen to the investigator's little green notebook, writes that down. The affidavit read and acknowledged or admitted to by the individual. That's evidence. Part of what the Food and Drug Administration investigators do when they conduct inspections is to collect evidence. Evidence of what? Evidence of potential violative acts and violations of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Interviews of employees. How many here have been in a situation where you've had to deal with, F with an FDA investigator asking to interview one or more of your employees? It's just at random. How do you handle that? How, would you, how, did, how was that handled? That's a great answer. Depends on what it's for. Anybody else? Any comments on that? It does depend on what it's for. And you want to make sure, um, you want to make sure that the, you have the right person to do the explaining. You want to make sure that you have someone that can express themselves clearly and articulately. You want to have someone that is familiar with the process. If it's a matter of an investigator not understanding a process or a procedure or a technique or something, um, and you don't have someone there at that particular moment, in my opinion, I think it would be reasonable to say, give us a few minutes, we'll find someone that can answer your question and allow the investigator to keep moving with the, with the inspection. Now, I'm going to drop a footnote to go ahead because it was a draft guidance issued in July having to do with delaying, denying, limiting, and refusing inspections. And this all gets a little bit complicated sometimes when you think about it. And it also depends upon how assertive or how aggressive the individual investigator is uh, during the inspection. And to no small matter, it also depends upon the interpersonal relationship that your firm, you individually, or your escort has with the inv individual investigator during the course of the inspection. So again, interviews are not specifically authorized, but they're not specifically prohibited either. It's a case-by-case it's -case method, and your answer was a perfect answer. It depends on the subject. It depends on what it is. Um, there is a, a, this is a real hyper-technical thing. I uh, represented a company in a criminal case, a criminal drug case, uh, manufacturing case, and we got into a spitting match with the uh, Department of Justice attorneys. Um, over the, um, the government's attempt to interview current or former employees because they were preparing, they were looking for witnesses to testify at trial. And uh, long story short is that uh, the judge in the case, we got the judge to write an opinion, not giving us everything that we had requested on behalf of the firm. But the opinions, this opinion in the Bhutani case stands for the proposition that um, if there are employees that are deemed to be managerial level within the company, whose comments could be construed to bind the company to be able to uh, act as an admission, that's a, from a legal, technical legal point, an admission against the company's interest, at least in this particular case, um, the firm would be given notice and be given an opportunity to have a representative on behalf of the firm present uh, during those interviews. But that's a very unusual case, but it still is out there, it still exists, and it is a, um, an unusual situation. Photographs, again, not specifically authorized by the statute. Um, this has been an issue that has peaked and ebbed for many years uh, with the Food and Drug Administration. Um, there's nothing in the statute um, at the present time that specifically authorizes the taking of photographs. Because those of you who are familiar with Section 704, it does have some very specific language in there as to what investigators are allowed to, 
to look at the books and records and what they can't look at, the personnel files with some exception. Um, so FDA uh, for years, for decades, has taken the position that they have authority to take implant photographs. And the spinoff on that in our digital age is to take video recording. Um, there is value to taking those photographs. Uh, one of the cases that I handled when I was an assistant U.S. attorney um, from a prosecutor's point of view was a food dirty warehouse case. And one of the pieces of evidence that supported one of the six or seven charges in the criminal information that was filed against the company was an 8 by 12 or 8 by 10 color glossy of a little brown mouse sitting on top of a 100-pound bag of rice. It was potent evidence. That's a very good example of how photographs can be used in a very um, poignant way, I guess, in a very persuasive way. Um, so that's part of the reason why uh, there's a lot of back and forth uh, over the photographs. FDA and its in, um, inspections operations manual, and that's a document that we all should become familiar with, uh, is available on FDA's website. It's abbreviated IOM. Chapter 5 of the IOM deals with establishment inspections. And that chapter is also broken down into general information about inspections, but it also discusses ins inspections of, of uh, drug manufacturers, device manufacturers, food, and so forth. Uh, but in that IOM, FDA cites Dow Chemical and Acre Wholesale Grocery. Those two cases, one is, a, is an, uh, a case that was brought by the Environmental Protection Agency, Dow Chemical. That involved an aerial overflight of a retention pond of a of Dow Chemicals uh, facility in some place in Michigan, I believe. Uh, the court allowed those photographs uh, to be admitted into evidence. The Acre uh, wholesale case came out of the Central District of Iowa where there was no objection to the taking of the photographs at the time that the investigator came into the facility and started to take the photographs. So think ahead when you read the hypothetical that we have for a little bit later on. Think about that situation as an investigator coming into a facility and not asking permission, and they're pretty much instructed not to ask permission. They are instructed to assume that they have authority to take those photographs. So again, as with affidavits, consider whether you need to have some sort of a policy, an SOP, uh, that would address this situation where you had an investigator at least attempting to take photographs. Has that happened with anyone here? Yes, sir. Sure. Just a second. We have a microphone for you. Right here. Thank you. We, we have a policy, no photographs, because once in the past of our company, somebody took a picture of an employee and there was a patient's chart mm. on the table, and you could see the patient's name. Fortunately, it never made it to Facebook thankfully, but because of that issue, we've got signs all over our facility, no, no photography allowed. All right. What happens when the FDA comes in and wants to take pictures? Well, it, um, that's a very good example of um, where a firm needs to be prepared for that sort of eventuality and have some sort of an approach to do that. If you're concerned about protecting patients' privacy rights, there's certainly uh, in very strong, very firm ground being able to do that. Um, I think it's, it's becoming harder and harder and, and to, for industry to resist the taking of photographs and the videos. And, and I'm going to mention again this guidance document that was issued in July, July 12th of this year, having to do with delaying, limiting, and so forth of, of inspection. Um, there's also an analogous situation that involves the protection of trade secrets. Uh, that might be available. Um, my, my thought is that a firm it would be prudent for a firm to develop an SOP, an inspection procedure or practice, that would deal with cases such as that, so that, that in, the investigator, when they're there, can be advised of that early on, so that they know that there might be trade secret, there might be confidential patient information, that would be um, that might be the subject, or might be inadvertently in their situation included uh, in a in a photograph. Keep in mind 
those photographs become evidence, and that's that's the main reason why those those were taken. My personal opinion is that your your example is a is an exception that I hadn't come across before, but it's a very good example of, of what do you do. Um, my personal opinion is that photographs have the greatest impact, greatest negative impact on a firm in a sanitation case where you've got a dirty warehouse, where you've got a manufacturing operation that is messy, that's not very clean, that might be full of mold or other contaminants. I think those that's where the photographs um, are of the greatest value from from FDA's point of view of establishing a violation of the uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. As we all know, GMP violations, those are, for the most part, though there can be some sanitation issues involved with that, are, for the most part, uh, paper violations. They're record violations that have to be documented by the Food and Drug Administration. And again, um, be aware of this, and um, it, certainly it's online. Uh, I'll cover it in a, in a few more slides. But be aware of this draft guidance of circumstances that constitute delaying and denying because photographs are actually addressed in that document. Um, scope of inspection. What can FDA do? They can do... There's a question there. What do you recommend in writing in the SOP regarding photographs and uh, interview of employees? What do you recommend? What should I write in the SOP? If I have to create one. If, if what? If we have to create SOPs for interviewing employees as well as uh, taking photographs, how can we word it in the SOP that it doesn't hurt the investigator also? Well, you, that's, I think you've, you've touched on an important part of that. You don't want to have your, the firm's, activity interpreted to be in any way interfering with or obstructing uh, the inspection. And nobody's interested in doing that because that's, just, that's a non-starter. Uh, the content, uh, I don't know that I can offer you specific words, but I can give you concepts on that as far as, as, far as interviews. Um, that the, the firm should evaluate the request for an interview uh, depending upon this lady's answer before, it depends on what the subject is. It depends, on the, it depends on the issue. And the idea, from my point of view, is that you would want to shape the SOP um, in a way so that you would accomplish what you had mentioned, that you would be able to facilitate the inspection, that you would be able to get the information from one person to another person in the company so that the investigator would see uh, open cooperation and that there was somebody there that could convey the information that was knowledgeable and articulate about doing that. Uh, with regard to the photographs, something similar to what uh, this gentleman raised earlier about the taking of a photograph that inadvertently included some patient information, uh, you'd probably want to have something that might address a situation like that, though your firm may not be in the same situation as that, but you may have trade secrets. Um, and I think that it's the, I think the, that industry is getting to the outer limit of being able to reasonably object to the taking of photographs. But again, go back to the terms of Section 704 of the statute. The inspection has to be reasonable in manner, limits, and terms. So you might be able to work something in there looking at Section 704 and make sure that the position that the company takes is reasonable. Is there another question? Yeah, um, so I'm just, I, I guess I'm missing something here because I'm, I'm trying to see if they are not authorized, but you're saying they're allowed to take pictures. Can we, if we have a procedure in place and they still insist on taking pictures, then do we have legal grounds to stand on to say, mm, can we just move on? Um, you can try it. Uh, um, I don't mean to be... Uh, flippant about that. Um, this this is an area that has, as I mentioned, has been this has been debated. I, I even wrote a law review article on photo taking of photographs and during inspections uh, some time ago. Um, it's it's undecided. The case law is not specifically clear on it whether it's authorized or not. Um, I think 
given this this draft guidance when we get to that, and I would encourage you to to take a look at that. Um, it uses an example, meaning the draft guidance. It uses an example of limiting the inspection that can be considered to be a refusal of the inspection. And a refusal of the inspection is in and of itself a separate violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So if now with this new guidance, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, um, if someone has a policy limiting or prohibiting the taking of photographs during an inspection, it's going to be very interesting to see how FDA interprets its own draft guidance from last July on whether that constitutes limiting of an inspection that would then trigger some other action. Now, I know um, somewhat with the, t with the taking of uh, photographs and, and in another situation where when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, FDA came to me, the district office came to me, and remember on one of these earlier slides, there was mention there of, about an inspection warrant. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. An inspection warrant is a federal court order authorizing, directing the company to allow the inspection to go forward. And if they don't allow the inspection to go forward, it's considered to be a contempt of court. It's now not just Section 704 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, but it's a federal court order issued by a federal magistrate judge telling the owner-operator agent in charge of the facility that they must allow that FDA investigator in there. And guess what? In every inspection warrant I've ever seen or that I ever drafted, we always put in and is authorized to take photographs as part of the inspection. And that trumps everything else. That puts the whole issue to rest once the inspection warrant is, is issued. This is, a, this is going to be, I think, it's, going to, it's been an unclear area for years, and given the, 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 the wording of the, of the uh, draft guidance, I think it's going to stay a little bit murky, and, and who knows, there might even be a, some litigation to finally decide it. My personal opinion is the strength of the, the uh, ability of a firm to object to the to photographing and videotaping during an inspection has, has weakened over time. And I think it would, I would be surprised if a federal judge, if this issue were brought before a federal judge, if a federal judge would issue an opinion saying no photographs are allowed. I think we're at that point. It's unfortunate that the statute is not more specific about the taking of photographs. And at one time, several years ago, there was a proposal to amend the statute to the act um, that would allow, specifically allow the taking of photographs, but we're not there yet. But watch what happens with this draft guidance document on delaying, denying, limiting, or refusing inspections. I just wanted to clarify, um, when we go through the examples uh, throughout this presentation, and just using the photographs, for example, uh, is this only applying to U.S. drug manufacturing, or could these same, you know, issues come up uh, abroad and do they handle it differently I know their demeanor changes and they do have different concessions of you know they not announced audits but do they uh, handle some of their uh, things like picture taken differently the, I, they meeting the uh, US the, FDA investigators FDA once they're abroad because that's a you know a huge part of their inspections now and what a lot of us international companies are dealing with it's becoming more and more a part of it um, I have not had personal experience in having to deal with that and advising uh, a foreign manufacturing site on the topic of the specific topic of photographs, but I would not be surprised that uh, the investigators would conduct their inspections in very much the same way that they conduct them here. Um, I suspect also that foreign manufacturing sites may not be as sensitized to the issue of photograph as perhaps um, the domestic uh, manufacturing companies are. That would be my short answer to that. Um, yes, sir. Well, with regard to the draft guidance, even once it's finalized, am I mistaken? I'm thinking guidances are, they're always disclaimed as not legally binding. It's just current agency thinking on the topic, is it not? That's correct. That's correct. Um, what I was 
alluding to earlier is to keep an eye on how this, uh, how FDA uses this draft guidance. Um, there may be a situation where something is brought before a federal court and you might get a decision uh, on the issue of taking photographs themselves and possibly even on the, um, on the validity or the, the strength uh, of the draft guidance. But you're absolutely right, and it does say draft, and it's got the same language in this draft guidance document that all the others are. It's, just, it's FDA's current thinking. So that's why I think it's, it's an evolving issue. Just to answer your question, gentlemen, uh, I have one experience uh, for the foreign inspections by U.S. investigator. They have requested uh, a photograph, and the company has allowed them to take photographs. So just to answer that question. Now, what's, what some firms do, uh, and actually the investigators, if the investigator comes, starts taking photographs, and is told to stop taking the photograph or asked to stop taking the photographs by the firm. Uh, they are instructed to continue taking the photographs. They're also instructed that they are not to relinquish the film to the firm if they are requested for that. Uh, and it's in that situation where it gets, can, can get real tight, and that's when the investigator will probably go back to the district office, talk to his or her supervisor, They'll talk to somebody in the compliance branch in the um, district office. Somebody in the district will call FDA's general counsel and get an opinion as to what to do. And if they all vote in the same way, they'll do what I just referenced before. They'll come over to the local U.S. attorney's office and request the assistant United States attorney, which I was at one time, to prepare a motion and a order for an inspection warrant. And again, that would trump everything. That, that resolves the issue. So it's, it's always been a delicate balance, and it's always been a lot of interpersonal relationship between the investigator and the company. If there's a rational reason not to take the photographs, protecting patient privacy, protecting trade secrets, um, there typically is an opportunity for a workaround there. Um, the only argument that I, not the only, but an argument that I can think of at this point in time is the reasonableness of the investigator wanting to take um, photographs or to film, videotape uh, the operations. Yes, ma'am. Question? Uh, we've had uh, auditors come in and take photographs before. Like you said, they have to start snapping. And our policy states that you can't take any pictures unless it's extenuating circumstances. But if it's agreed upon and they do take pictures, you have to take, we have to take a picture of exactly what they're taking pictures of so that we have it for our records in case things go forward. Yes, just took the words out of my mouth. That was the other thing to, to consider is having someone else at the firm accompany the investigator and take side-by-side -side photographs so that you have your own record uh, of that. You can also try a Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information Act request for copies of the photos uh, from, the, from the district office. Uh, so we've seen uh, the, um, the agency has very broad inspectional powers here. They've got prescription, non-prescription drugs, biologics, veterinary products, um, Internal quality audits, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later, but typically as a matter of policy, and FDA does have a policy, a compliance policy guide, when in dealing with um, reports of internal quality audits, uh, if the firm has a procedure or process in place for conducting internal audits under a normal, normal inspection, the FDA investigators typically will not ask for those reports they may, in some circumstances, ask for some certification that there is a, a, a policy in place or a plan in place and that it has been implemented and that corrective actions have been uh, a result of, that, of those audits. And again, reasonable time, limits, and manner. Keep that in mind when you think about these inspections. Again, a reasonableness to the extent necessary to ensure compliance with the Act. Uh, and they focus on the, on the records that are required 
either under the statute or under regulations to be kept. Um, and that's why these types of records, financial records, sales records, pricing, personnel, and research data are typically not uh, within FDA's scope of inspectional authority. A couple of exceptions, uh, the personnel data can be produced or can be requested and should be produced when it relates to individuals' qualifications, their education, training, and experience uh, to be able to perform their tasks. Uh, sales data, not so much the volume in sales, but shipping records. They use that, they, FDA, the investigators, use that to establish uh, shipment in interstate commerce. Um, here, we talked about this a little bit, refusing an inspection. Um, the administrative inspection warrant, that's a judicial warrant that goes, that is issued by the federal court. Um, it is also uh, a prohibited act uh, to refuse to permit access to the facility or the copying of records. Uh, and it's a, a refusal, it's a violation of the statute to refuse entry for the purposes of conducting um, an inspection. And something um, new uh, is that with the uh, amendment, the recent amendments of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act, the FDAsia, I believe it's called, um, the revised language in the statute now deems drugs to be adulterated if there is a delay or denial or a limit or a refusal of the inspection. So that's potentially a very heavy hammer that the Food and Drug Administration now has uh, for uh, conducting its inspections and using this uh, classification, if you will, of adulteration for the products under those circumstances. And again, here's the guidance. You can get it on FDA's website. And here's what it did. Two interesting uh, amendments, or one interesting amendment uh, for, with regard to inspections, uh, and that is that FDA may now, prior to an inspection, request records uh, to review before the inspection starts, or as the language of the amendment says, in lieu of an inspection. So this is another area that I think will be interesting to see how this, uh, how this develops. And the responsibility is put on the firm uh, to respond within a reasonable time, of, within reasonable limits, uh, to um, FDA's request. But FDA has to put the request in writing, and it has to be very specific uh, as to the types of records uh, that FDA is looking for. Um, and again, um, this is a, what we're talking about with, this, uh, with, with, regard, with regard to the guidance. The statute was actually amended uh, to consider the drug adulterated if the facility refuses, denies, or limits um, the inspection. Here are some examples that came out of, um, or that come out of, actually, uh, FDA's uh, guidance document. Uh, examples that they gave for the delay of uh, inspections uh, would be the delaying of a pre-announced inspection. Perhaps this might, this possibly could be a foreign inspection, but it also could be a domestic inspection as well. Um, delays during the inspection um, and producing records, delays in producing records. Now, what does this mean? Who knows? We have to have to watch this and see how this develops and see how the, the cases that we have a question over here and see how the how the inspections develop and it'll probably evolve on an inspection by inspection basis we had a recent experience with the fda on producing records um it it, it really stipulated through the lead investigator after about four hours into the inspection that any record that is produced after one hour would be considered inexistent. Talking about reasonableness, re reasonableness or not, that was the rule of the game how throughout did, the inspection. How did the inspection go? <laughs> um, we had a couple of observations. 
in the 483. Mm -hmm. how, was, how would you describe the tenor of that uh, investigation? How would you describe the interaction between, was it one investigator? No, three. How, it was a posse. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe the interaction between those investigators and the people in the plan? Um, quite respectful, quite, quite friendly, but uh, one of them was quite antsy in, in getting his documents sooner than later. Yeah. And then when he had a couple of uh, instances when records took about a couple of hours to produce, he announced anything over an hour is going to be considered inexistent. <laughs> had, had something been happening up to that point? Had there been repeated requests or just... No. And there were repeated simultaneous requests from all three. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm assuming that, um, that a reason or a potential reason for the delay or the length of time, let's not call it a delay, but the, that the reason for the length of time in, in producing the records it had something to do with maybe where the records were located or being able to exactly find them. Exactly it. Maybe they were off-site and had they, to be retrieved. They were off-site. All right. And they still did not accept that, that rationale. Um, that's, I've, I have a hard time accepting that, personally. Um, I don't know if you would if you put that in a, in a situation or a category of, of, a, um, of a difficult investigator. Um, and then that raises another question that um, oftentimes comes up in these inspections. How do you deal, how do you deal with a difficult uh, investigator? I had a client one time um, that an investigator had some of the people in the, in the facility uh, literally in tears because of the interrogation. There's a woman here nodding her head, too. That sounds like it might have happened there. So. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, by the way. That's a very interesting, very uh, good example. So how do you deal? How do you deal with, we have another question over here, uh, Candy? No. Right? Oh, I, please, go ahead. Just out of curiosity, which district was that investigator out of? <laughs> just, just a curiosity question. <laughs> he didn't hear you. Sir? They want to know what district. Canada. Canada. Was it a U.S. FDA person in Canada? My goodness. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Um, well, back to my little story about uh, this one investigator who was uh, really riding roughshod over the individuals there. Um, it reminds me of this, this dynamic. There's this complaint about it. Don't complain about it. Just swallow hard and go on. Um, I'm of the opinion uh, that it's um, it's not bad to complain sometimes, um, and it depends on how you do it. It's the old the old adage about it's not what you say, it's the way that you say it, um, and it's also sometimes it's not it depends on who says it. Um, I was asked by the firm to do something about it, and which I did. Um, and I went to the um, I went to the district director and the uh, director of the inspections branch and explained to them as objectively as I could after I had talked with the people in the plant to get some examples of what was going on, what was happening. And it's my opinion that investigators that are um, I'll say from my point of view, overly aggressive. That's my characterization. But they might be overly aggressive or overly assertive. And they may not always be the most informed either. Sometimes those two characteristics are companions. Um, it may not be the first time that those supervisors have heard something about those people that are working for them. And so you may be doing the district office a service uh, by bringing that type of behavior to their attention. That however, puts the supervisory staff and the district office in an awkward position. So now you've got some guy coming in complaining about the investigator on behalf of his client. What's the district director or the, the director of the inspections branch uh, supposed to do? Pull the uh, investigator off the inspection? That sends a message that maybe the district director or the supervisors don't want to have sent. 
Um, so that, that's the other side of the coin. But I think, depending again on the circumstances and how severe it is, um, I, I personally don't see anything wrong with having somebody bring that behavior to the attention of the district office management. But it has to be done in a, and I believe in a non-confrontational, objective, factual way, so that it doesn't look like you get. You've got to give the the district management an opportunity to take care of their personnel issues. Is there a question here? Uh, well, my question was uh, more regarding what was the topic about the records that were not uh, provided to them. What was the topic? This mean, meaning the subject matter of what they were asking for? Yeah, because what was the, because you indicated that it was requested three times by the three inspectors. No, no. So the question was one inspector. Mm -hmm. And then only that inspector was quite angry about getting the problem. Mm -hmm. But what I was saying is we were asking for documents not obtaining three okay. different documents. So the issue there, the issue in your situation was the physical location of the documents. They were at a remote location and it took time, one, to locate them and two, to retrieve them. Yeah. I think also we have to um, keep in mind if this is a facility, has, if this is a reinspection, if it was a for cause audit and they're going back to reinspect and the investigator is indeed being overly aggressive and is going in with a predisposed um, attitude and I think that also causes a lot of issues it can it, it really can and it, this reminds me of another topic that that um, uh, we'll cover when we get to the responding to 43s and then actually preparing for and handling inspections is that I my personal opinion is I think it's very important to have um, an escort or escorts um, that assist the uh, investigators uh, during the course of the inspection, but those escorts, I, I think um, it behooves the company to have escorts that are knowledgeable in the, in the firm's operations, and, and if it takes more than one escort, so be it. If you've got different types of specialized activities, that they are articulate, they can, they can convey information, and that they are personable, that they are non-confrontational, because sometimes these inspections can, can turn just on the on the behavior of a personality, and sometimes the, the escorts um, need to have a high threshold of pain because there are some investigators, and word gets around, word gets around which investigators are good and which ones aren't, and which ones have a chip on their shoulder. Uh, so you've got to kind of almost anticipate or try to plan for that and, and adjust that. That's I think it's I think having the appropriate people, the appropriate staff during the investigation, interacting with the uh, with the investigators, I think is very important, and it's also very helpful uh, for a firm. Yes, ma'am, we have a question, a question here? So yes, sir. I was just going to make a comment. We have a similar scenario a few months ago in um, Kansas City, and documents are off-site in New Jersey, D.C., and have to go back to headquarters in Germany. Uh, at the end of the day, um, it was a PAI, and um, we just promise them to give them the, all the documents and send it to them at the agency and they can have a copy to review all the time they want. And um, it, it, it's a relationship issue also, how you build the inspector at the site and how you deal with it. And we just said, well, you know what? Um, we can get all the records to you on time. We'll just send you a copy and you can read it when you get back. And if you have any problems, just let us know. And it, and it worked out well for you? Oh, yeah. See, I think what you've touched on, you mentioned the word relationship issue. It, it is a relationship issue, and um, uh, if an investigator gets an idea in their head that for some reason, justified or otherwise, that a firm is trying to stonewall or trying to delay or trying to hide something, boy, that's a slippery slope, and it can go down real fast, and it's very hard to retrieve that balance uh, once they are at that point. I remember uh, some time back 
Um, another lawyer and I were uh, representing a client that was not only being inspected but was under investigation. Um, and there was an investigator, the FDA investigator came to the, came to the facility and wanted to talk to uh, one of the employees. The firm agreed to allow to have that um, and wanted the lawyers there at the time that the, the interview took place. Well, the investigator showed up somewhere around 8 or 8.30 in the morning. The employee had just gotten there. We had just gotten there at the time that the investigator said they wanted to talk to Jane Doe. And we said, that's fine. Just give us a few minutes. We'd like to, to explain to this person what's, what was going on. Um, and because in the situation, we as lawyers were representing the company. We were not representing any individual. So we had to make sure that the individuals understood that we as lawyers, that our client was the firm. It was not the individual person working for the company and explain that delicate situation. And that if they wanted their own attorney, that they would be entitled to get an attorney on to represent themselves and so on and so on. That investigator uh, quite aggressively said, I want to see that uh, employee right now, or I'm considering this a refusal of the inspection. And we said, well, we only really want 20 minutes to talk to this person. But that was, an, that was my personal example of a very aggressive uh, investigator. So again, it's relationships, it's the personalities of the people involved, and you can't predict that. And each inspection is different in each aspect of the inspection. And Sometimes without notice, something can happen during the course of an inspection, and boy, that attitude can just uh, frost over like you wouldn't believe. Um, it's, a, it's a delicate situation. Okay, these are some of FDA's uh, examples that appear in this guidance document from July. And again, uh, it's on FDA's website. I would suggest that you locate it and, uh, and read it. Uh, denials. First, first aspect, the first element is delays. Now we're talking about denials, um, where the um, firm rejects attempts to schedule the inspection, um, putting it off uh, or just saying, no, we're not going to allow it, uh, doesn't allow the inspection to begin. Um, third item here, no inspection due to the absence of certain staff. Keep this in mind when you read the hypothetical. Um, the woman in there, uh, Ms. Beckman, who was the regulatory affairs person, uh, <clears throat> was, is more experienced than the person that met the investigator in this hypothetical. Uh, so keep that in mind as far as with this new draft guidance now in place, what would FDA, what, what attitude, if you will, or what position would FDA take about being asked for a particular person to be present during the course of the um, of the inspection. And this, uh, this is an example that FDA gave. That somebody must have given FDA at some time in the past a false statement about, no, there are no drugs manufactured here. So that certainly, that's an obvious, I think that's a no-brainer. Uh, limiting an inspection, uh, limiting, obviously, limiting access to the facility itself or to certain uh, manufacturing areas, uh, limiting the um, uh, amount of time that uh, an investigator would be allowed to view the operations as long as their being there is reasonable and their request is reasonable. Uh, they probably should have reasonable access to that for a reasonable uh, period of time. Uh, one, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, there's a question back there. Um, one more story, again, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney representing FDA, <clears throat> and FDA came over looking for an inspection warrant, what had happened is the FDA investigator had gone to the facility. It was a <clears throat> fairly small operation, but nevertheless, the owner-operator there started removing all of the light bulbs in the facility so the investigator couldn't see, <laughs> see the operation. Can you imagine that? Yes. True story. It did happen. Sir, you have a question? Uh, quick question, please, on restricting access. For certain types of manufacturing operations, like sterile operations, what we've seen is, for example, there are some European regulators that absolutely expect access to Class B areas to be able to observe uh, sterile manufacturing. Um, from, from a risk perspective, 
we we as an organization are very uncomfortable letting anyone into that kind of an area that hasn't done gowning qualification that hasn't had microbial testing that sort of a process legitimately takes at best several days before you can feel comfortable allowing a person into the area would that be considered limiting or denial um, under the scene that you've described, I would, uh, my initial reaction is to concur with your concern over that. And I think you're justified in, in being concerned over that because it's your company's name that's on that, presumably on that finished product that goes out the door. Um, I think as I was listening to you describe that, the thought came to my mind as one of education, of how do you educate, how do you educate that investigator the importance of what's going on. That also tells me that if that investigator is there uh, requesting that access, that might be a demonstration of their lack of education or training or experience to know what really is required um, under those manufacturing circumstances and how disruptive their entering the area might be uh, to that process. Thank you very much. Yeah, questions? Uh, to answer your question in the back, we've had that happen in our facility, and it is a double-edged sword because if you let them in, they're going to cite you for letting them in because they have to go through all the processes. And particularly with PI or GHA, they're very, very concerned about classifications. So your best bet, when we've always found worked really well, is yes, you can, but you need to let us work through this, and you have to go through our process first. So most of them don't have time to do that and won't take you up on it. Good, good idea, good suggestions. Uh, back to photography. We spent some minutes earlier talking about the photography. These are FDA examples out of the guidance, the draft guidance document, about how they may consider uh, limiting photography to uh, result in limiting an inspection that might cause some concerns or some, sort of some problems for the firm. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my personal opinion is it's, it's in sanitary conditions that are the, usually the, the subject matter of photographs that carry the most impact. So you might have rodent insect contamination, um, maintenance that's uh, deferred or need of uh, something needed in repair, contamination of raw materials, uh, labels or labeling. Sometimes what FDA does in the old, old days, they used to do tracings. If there was a piece of equipment, like a medical device, a large piece of equipment, <clears throat> that couldn't be collected, you couldn't, that they couldn't sample. They used to have tracing paper and take tracings of the label. Now they can take a photograph, a digital photograph uh, of the uh, label or labeling that's on the product and uh, pu put that into their establishment inspection report. Um, access or copying of records, um, review or refusal of the shipping records, that's a key issue with FDA. Um, a partial reduction. Um, records that are unreasonably redacted. Uh, and again, these are all the records that are required to be kept uh, by the facility. Um, and sampling, the collecting of, of samples, because sampling is also a matter of evidence, whether they're environmental samples, whether they're samples of filth or contamination, finished product samples. That's all something that Again, you may want to go back to look at your um, SOPs for inspections. What's, what's the firm's policy on sampling? Do you charge for samples? Or do you allow the, the FDA investigator? You're entitled to charge for samples. Do you, do you or don't you? So, um, Refusal. Refusal of an inspection can be done uh, through, uh, uh, I guess, affirmative or indirect ways. Um, you can stop the investigator from coming in. You can, in my example, you could uh, unscrew the light bulbs so they can't see what's going on. Uh, they could keep the padlock on the door and and uh, not let anyone in. Uh, one inst one example that FDA gave uh, was that the firm refused to return phone calls to FDA with regard to the inspection. Inspection frequency. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This has changed a little bit. Um, particularly for drugs, uh, devices, at least once every two years, beginning with the date of registration. Um, 
FDA now has established, and we've been talking about risk-based uh, approaches to inspections for some period of time now, um, they now have established uh, in the statute a risk-based schedule for drug inspections. Typically, or in the past, the drug inspections were once within every two years. Sometimes more frequently, depending upon how much attention FDA felt, <clears throat> pardon me, that the firm needed. Uh, now, FDA will establish, as we're in the process of establishing these factors that they will consider it, uh, in determining how frequently a drug establishment will be uh, inspected. So they'll look at the compliance history, they'll look at the uh, history and nature and number and significance of recalls that the firm has had, um, just the inherent risk of the drug. So that, to my mind, though the FDA didn't put this in the document, <coughs> excuse me, to my mind that um, uh, makes me think of uh, narrow therapeutic range drugs, things that have a, a very sensitive uh, manufacturing uh, parameters. Um, how often the firm has been inspected and what those inspections have, uh, have produced. And FDA has now, well, after a period of years, is moving toward developing some system to recognize foreign government inspection uh, units, if you will. And it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because for years and years and years, FDA um, has, re has resisted that, uh, the acceptance of foreign inspection uh, qualifications. And part of that process uh, will be some form of monitoring or auditing of the quality of those foreign inspection agents, if you will, um, that do the inspections. That also will relate to the to the um, admissibility, if you will, for foreign manufactured drug products that are offered for import. So again, this is a developing area and it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Sir? Yeah, that's about the frequency of the inspection. We have CMO and who have two facilities, two sites for the whole, whole process. And one, normally FDA and we'll inspect the two sites at the same time because then that's uh, for uh, PAI and need to be done at the same time. However, and somehow, and one of the facility got inspected after one year of the uh, previous inspection because of another PAI and need only one size. And then after a while, and we receive it uh, and pre-announced notice from FDA said, hey, you have facility, the other one, has not been inspected for two years and then we need to inspect them. In spite it, and then I uh, replied to say, okay, and you normally inspect two at the same time. The other one has been inspected just a few months ago. <laughs> and could you please and schedule two together a little bit later? And by the end of response, and after a few months, and I receive another uh, notice from another scheduler, say, hey. We have sent you the notice and what time and, and which, which month we stayed, and then we have not get it uh, scheduled yet. I so I responded, well, I, I respond to you a few months ago and like in five days and tell you, and we are okay to, <laughs> to be inspired, but I just tell you, the other one has just been inspired. <laughs> So you're having difficulty getting the coordination No, 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 no difficulty. I, I just respond to them and then they, they didn't respond to me yet. And I didn't want to ask, but I just wonder and someday they will send me another notice. So, hey, <laughs> this has not been inspected. <laughs> they can schedule any time, but they, they just send me the notice once a while and I respond it and then they, do, they just didn't schedule. I guess the best comment on that is FDA is what it does, I suppose. <laughs> it's hard to predict. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to finish off on these criteria that FDA, and this is the one that's really open-ended, other criteria deemed necessary and appropriate by FDA, whatever that, whatever that might mean. But again, I think this is another one of those areas that's, that's going to evolve over a period of time. Um, 
Just some thoughts. We talked about an inspection SOP. And this is on the on the slide. We can you can take a look at it. Um, some general topics, kind of by subject matter, of what you might want to consider, including in, a, in an SOP uh, for handling inspections. Uh, access to documents, handling confidential documents that we talked about before. Sampling, how are you going to handle the sampling? You might want to consider taking a duplicate sample yourself at the same time. Same thing as when you produce records or produce documents. Again, think about this in the hypothetical. Um, make more than one copy. Keep a copy for yourself. Um, Photographs, permitting or not permitting, just have a policy on it, uh, if you can. Uh, corrections made during the inspection, uh, responses to the 483, uh, how you're going to handle the inspection. Some companies have, some firms have <coughs> a room where people are in the back room and they communicate by email uh, as to what's going on so they can send an email to their colleague. The investigators looking for complaint files between this date and this date, so the people in the back room can start, you know, having their messengers go out and pull out the, the, the files. It can be a very hectic situation sometimes. Some of you know that you've been through it, and it's hard to keep track of everything. So it's and it's sometimes it's difficult to keep a person's wits about themselves when, particularly if you have an, an aggressive investigation going on. Um, and. Um, um, Keep in mind, too, what the former or the prior 483s covered and what type of information is, is contained not only in the 483 but in the firm's uh, responses. There are some sources. The gentleman here earlier asked for suggestions on um, uh, items to be included in an SOP, an inspection SOP. There are sources. Um, I would recommend the FDA's Investigations Operations Manual, particularly Chapter 5. Um, the centers each have a, a guidances. There are guidance in the drug area. There are guidances for pre-approval inspections, for sterile manufacturing, for uh, aseptic fill. Uh, just a, there are just a bunch of guidances, and you might want to take a look at those because you may find some interesting information uh, in there. Um, what does FDA do before an inspection? Um, each one's different. Each inspection's different. Each investigator prepares differently. Um, but uh, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll go back and they'll read uh, prior 483s and responses, warning letters if there are any, and I would think almost certainly read the establishment inspection reports, uh, which <clears throat> I assume everybody has seen an establishment inspection report uh, at one time or another, um, because those are it, it's a goldmine of information at times to be able to, to see that uh, establishment inspection report, because it's a separate report from the 483. It's the narrative report prepared by the investigator that documents pretty much everything the investigator or investigators did from the time they walked into the facility to the time they left the facility, including persons with whom they spoke during the course of the investigation. And, and one indicator of the status of a firm vis-a-vis -vis FDA is the availability of that firm's establishment inspection report. Um, FDA some years ago initiated a policy where if the firm were um, classified, no action indicated, uh, the, the district office would routinely send out a copy of the firm's establishment inspection report with a cover letter. If, however, a firm is under consideration, if you will, for additional regulatory action, either a warning letter or possibly an enforcement action, those establishment inspection reports are not generally available. Uh, if a firm gets into a situation where they're involved in litigation, then through the litigation, through the formal discovery process in the litigation, those, form, those forms or those reports, the EARs, uh, can be produced. So that's kind of, a, kind of a rule of thumb, if you will. If the EIR is available, uh, it's probably reasonable to assume that the firm is kind of low on FDA's horizon. Um, but if the EIR is not available, that means that it's still an open investigative file, that FDA still has something they're considering uh, about the firm, and they won't release that. And their enforcement actions, and typically uh, judicial enforcement, enforcement actions, I'm not talking about administrative actions such as import alert or detentions. But the, the three main judicial actions that FDA has are in uh, seizure, 
injunction and criminal prosecution. So what FDA does is they package up this information, the EIR, the 483s, and the responses, any warning letters and the responses, and then those, are go, those go through a series of levels of review within the Food and Drug Administration, within the center. It's reviewed, those documents are reviewed by the Office of Enforcement uh, within FDA. They're reviewed by FDA's Office of Chief Counsel. And then if within FDA as the administrative agency, there is a, a decision that they should go forward with this enforcement action, then it is sent over to the Department of Justice. Although FDA has a bunch of lawyers, uh, by statute, the only lawyers that are allowed uh, to represent FDA and many other federal agencies in federal court is the Department of Justice. So if you think of the Department of Justice in D.C. as the home office with 94 uh, local offices, if you will, around the country and in a couple of territories of the United States, each of those offices has at least um, has a federal court or jurisdictions has a federal court. And also in that jurisdiction is one United States attorney and multiple assistant United States attorneys that represent FDA as well as other federal agencies in federal court. So there's a collaboration between FDA and the Department of Justice, but it's the Department of Justice that are the lawyers authorized to appear in federal court on behalf of FDA. So there has to be some, some uh, cooperation and collaboration between the lawyers at FDA and the Department of Justice lawyers in bringing uh, an enforcement action. Um, okay, the 483's warning letters, this is what the FDA investigators review. They'll look at the, it's maybe the compliance policy guides. They might confer with somebody at the respective center. Uh, there might be some issue that the center has that they're um, uh, investigating or want to have more information about. This is also kind of an interesting, but also a very useful sometimes uh, piece of information. The filings, the public filings that, the, that a firm makes if it's publicly traded, some um, a filing that might be made with the Securities and Exchange Commission's talking about uh, the company's uh, regulatory status. Okay, during the inspection. Um, during your inspections, do you talk with the investigator? Do you get the daily wrap-up? Do you get the daily download uh, from them? Um, that's, they're doing that. Um, actually, there's a section in the inspection, Investigations Operations Manual that directs them, instructs them to do this. Um, the other side of the coin is industry side. This is also a golden opportunity for industry during the course of the inspection after you've developed a nice rapport with the investigator to talk with the investigator and kind of get a, a feel for the tone of the inspection, how it's going and uh, what might be ahead uh, for the company. Uh, asking questions, it's always tricky. These are kind of, this is a little bit of hyperbole, if you will. Um, but um, a, a colleague and I, some time of back kind of compiled, put our heads together and came up with these. Then there, there's another slide here that have some things as silly as they might sound. These have been asked. If we do this, will we pass the inspection? Um, how should we do it? Should we validate our process? You know? uh, may I release product even though technically out of specification? that there's a message conveyed there other than the obvious question itself. Those are, questions, those are the types of questions to avoid. I guess the rule of thumb was, and we all know that if, if you're not prepared to accept the answer, do I really have to validate this? Don't ask the question. Uh, again, this is a collaboration of some things that uh, you wouldn't think that necessarily that none of us here would um, think about saying, but sometimes these things are said. Yes, believe it or not, I wasn't there, but I'm told on reliable source that really was said. So only one person died. Only one. Um, the 483. We all talk about the 483 and what and it's what's the FDA's authority to issue it. It come, it goes back to uh, 704. And if you look on the one of the handouts. That is the 
483, you look in the lower left-hand corner, inspectional observations, you look at the second page of that. What's up here now mimics that. It says that, this, that these observations of objectionable conditions and practices listed on the front of the form are issued pursuant to section 704 and they are also or to assist the firm uh, in complying with the regulations uh, and the act. So it, every once in a while it might not be a bad idea to read, read those forms. FD is pretty good about putting a lot of information in it. Uh, what is the 483? It's the investigator's impression, it's the investigator's opinion, observation of what they believe to be violations of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act or potential violations uh, of the act. Uh, they don't represent the agency's final determination. Uh, they are the investigator's opinion of what they saw and their interpretation of what they saw during the inspection. The 483 performs a very valuable and very, very important function along the lines the same way that a warning letter provides very valuable function for FDA. And that is to provide written notice to the top management in the company. It's no accident, it's by design, that FDA investigators issue the 483 to the most responsible individual in the facility that they can find. Uh, and it's no accident that the warning letters are always addressed to the CEOs or presidents or whoever of the firms. And this goes back quite a few years to a, a criminal case, a dirty warehouse case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And it showed in a, the, the concept here is responsible relationship that people have, a, that certain people in a firm bear a responsible relationship for, in the first case, preventing objectionable conditions from arising. And two, if they do arise, to make sure that those objectionable conditions are corrected in a speedy and an efficient manner. So there's a, there's a method to FDA's madness in this, in, in sending out, issuing the 483s and sending out uh, warning letters and the persons to whom those documents are addressed. Uh, timing of the 483, we all know it comes at the end of the inspection. Sometimes the inspection will end and then the investigator will disappear for a few days or a week or more and come back with the type version. Uh, of it, and that's, that all goes back to Section 704 um, of the statute. Uh, <clears throat> the investigators are instructed that the observations uh, should be significant and that they should correlate or relate to the, uh, the products or the processes that were observed, um, and that they should consider observations of questionable significance, um, mentioning them. Um, and discussing them with management. Now, those of you who have been through um, uh, inspections know that this varies from investigator to investigator, how much discussion you get and how willing they are to say, uh, you know, you've got a little something going on over here, you may want to look at it. I don't think it's real serious right now, but if you don't correct it, uh, it might turn up as an observation in the, in the future. Uh, again, instructions, these are instructions to the um, uh, to the investigator uh, to make sure that their observations are clear and specific, uh, that they are significant, and in FDA's words and its IOM, uh, length does not equal significance. The longer the observation doesn't necessarily make it more significant than something that's uh, shorter. They shouldn't repeat themselves, and they should try to rank the observations in order of significance with the most significant observation in the investigator's mind uh, coming first, and of course they should be uh, legible, and, and they are encouraged to note on the 483s if there are recurring observations, things that have been noted before and not corrected. And um, I just worked with a client uh, very recently on a on a 483, a sort of a follow-up uh, inspection, and. Um, I was a little bit personally disappointed and, and uh, a lot dismayed at the number of repeat observations um, and the interpretation that that has to send uh, to the Food and Drug Administration because it comes to the point of um, 
the, somebody there doesn't understand, or if they do understand, they're not doing the right thing, and why aren't they doing the right thing to address these repeat violations? Well, repeat violations, as we all know, are certainly not, not a good thing. Uh, And how about the observations and corrected during the inspection? By inspection in one week, and we corrected uh, the observation in during the week before the 43 is issued, and we discussed and to the investigators. We have many inspections, and looks like, and there's no general standards, and some. In, uh, investigators and we say, okay, we're not put on right. for it. Some say, oh yes, I mean, I, I noticed that you did some corrections, but uh, it's still my uh, opinion to put on the for it. Right, and they'll take the position in the latter case. That sometimes they'll take the position that, well, that was when I observed it at the time. That's how I observed it at the time. You can put that in your response uh, to the 483, and the people in the district office will consider that. That's that's. That's not an unusual situation. That's a little bit, you'd like him to be a little bit more responsive to that. But again, that, I think that attests to the variability of the investigators. That's, you know, FDA um, talks to industry repeatedly about having a validated process. Well, FDA's inspection process is not a validated process. So it, it's, um, it's a difficult, difficult situation. Uh, it, that you've described there about uh, inconsistency in the way they handle corrective actions during the inspection. Um, what do we do on this side of the table? Well, we, um, I think the discussion with management, the closeout um, meeting is, is critical. It's a very important stage of the investigation. Um, some of those are better, and by that I mean more informative from industry side, depending upon the uh, willingness of the investigator to talk about what they saw. I think a lot of that is, is their person, their individual personality and also their experience. The more experienced investigators, the people that are more comfortable and, and are talking about it, are willing to talk about it and explain uh, what their observations were. And certainly that's an opportune time to ask questions and to, feel, to see if we, uh, you can get more information at the time. Um, and I'm sure you all do this, make sure everybody in the room, make, first of all, make sure the right people are in the room. Make sure the people that know they had something to do with the inspection or know about the subject matter. They don't all have to talk, and it might be better for very few people to talk at that time. But make sure the appropriate people are there so that you can gauge the tone of the, of the discussion with the investigator. Uh, and make sure everybody has a copy of the 483 so that they can follow along on it. It's not going to upset the investigator to take a few minutes to run off a half a dozen or so copies uh, of a 483 while they sit in a conference room and, uh, and wait. And then comes the response. We have to talk about um, the response, and we will shortly. Um, Post-inspection activities, what does FDA do? The FDA investigator goes back to the district, writes up the, the establishment inspection report that uh, we mentioned before. Uh, talks about that. That's the long, that's the detailed narrative of the ins of the inspection. Um, there's district office supervisory review. Um, the, the more review that there's done by the supervisors, the worse it is, I think, for the company sometimes. Uh, FDA will classify the inspection, NAI, VAI, or OAI. No action indicated, voluntary action indicated, or official action indicated. Um, the official action indicated um, means that the, that the compliance branch, not just the inspections branch of the district office, uh, will get involved and review it. And at that point, possibly even somebody from the Office of Compliance at the respective center will be involved and maybe even somebody from FDA's Office of Chief Counsel. Um, just very quickly, uh, and again, this is in, in the FDA's IOM. These are not all but these are some of the items that are included um, as far as topics, uh, headlines, if you will, in the establishment inspection report. Uh, the narrative report, and there's a specific requirement that it be in English. Individual responsibility, the persons who were interviewed or, dis or with whom the um, agent or the investigator uh, talked about the operations. Any supporting evidence or um, uh, 
relevance of the evidence that's in there because remember this what FDA is doing here in part is gathering evidence it's not just a come out and let's see how you're doing and we're going to give you a gold star um, any samples collected and then copies of any documents that were obtained during the course of the inspection whether they're batch uh, review or batch records uh, schematics um, and SOPs of any kind Okay, let's take a short break here. Let's take about, uh, will 10 minutes be enough? Yeah, All right, come back at a quarter to or 13 minutes to, and then we'll talk about uh, the follow-up to the inspections and the hypothetical. <laughs> okay, we're back. Uh, we took a little bit longer break than they anticipated. We had a nice discussion uh, and some questions uh, during the break, and that took a little bit longer. Um, there was someone here that had a question, and there's a gentleman over here who's also part of our group that had an, um, an answer to it, and I'd like for you, to, I'd like to share that with you. Um, do you advise your clients to ask for the EIR? I do, and in some cases, uh, as a, um, I've even made the request on behalf of the client. Uh, sometimes um, that might get a little bit more attention just because of the letterhead. Um, and I know of situations where the EIR should have been issued in the normal course of events after the inspection within a reasonable period of time, uh, and, it, and it hasn't been. <clears throat> it's not because the firm was classified um, official action indicated. It's just because somebody in the district office dropped the ball. Um, which leads me to a comment on another uh, question. There was a, someone here during the break that asked about um, foreign establishments receiving copies of the establishment inspection report. Um, I think the general rule applies to them as well, and I suspect that if the firm doesn't, that's been inspected does not have any uh, further action contemplated by FDA, uh, they should in due course receive a copy of the establishment inspection report. But if they don't, and time has passed, they should certainly feel free to contact FDA uh, to request a copy of the uh, inspection report. Number um, someone else that had a question about we're discussion we had about photographs. Thanks. I had a question in regards to the photos because of our recent inspection, and I wanted to know once you've uh, allowed the FDA to take photos. How do you ensure that that photo doesn't get out to the public? How do you secure, secure that as your intellectual property? Um, so that was my concern because we had a recent incident or a recent um, photo request by the FDA mm -hmm. in our inspection. Uh, there are some things that, um, that, some steps that can be taken. And the, who's, where's the gentleman that was part of there? Please. So in a, in a similar situation to what you've just described, um, maybe just a moment about how we handle inspections when when we have an FDA inspector come in we make sure we have enough personnel inspection support to keep the inspector you know appropriately supported and you know facilitate what they want to do so in this in this case when we had uh, the inspector taking pictures we had just requested at the beginning of the inspection we're not going to get in the way of you taking any pictures please take whatever pictures you deem appropriate we're going to ask you to let us know before you take a picture so that we can have one of our runners take the exact same picture with our with our camera so we've got a running record just like we're doing for the documentation you've requested. So at the end of the day, we take a look at all of the pictures and say, for example, picture number seven comes back with you know uh, 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 an artifact in the picture that indicates intellectual property or I think is the, the, the one example was earlier, maybe some patient information. What we then do is formally notify the inspector on, on picture number seven. You've got a picture of intellectual property. We're putting you on notice that you know we're we're letting you know it's intellectual property. We're asking you to make sure that all appropriate care is taken to assure that this information doesn't get out into the public. And at the risk of being a little bit cynical, I don't know that you can do a whole lot more than that, other than just sort of make the request and and put the put the official on notice that you've identified that. Thank you both for your comments. Um, this reminds me, a couple of my partners uh, recently wrote an article for the uh, journal 
uh, dealing with this issue of protecting trade secrets. If after the program, if you'd like to give me your business card with your email address on it, I'll, I'll do my very best to see that you get a copy of that article that might shed a little bit of light on this topic. How can, how can you know whether the investigator will use all the pictures, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, in the EIR, or if he or she didn't use it, and what will happen to that picture? Um, it, my personal opinion is that the, um, the real um, value and the, and the real um, help to FDA of photographs is if they support, um, directly if they support, a violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, if they show some violative act. I know that this, this area th that I'm about to describe doesn't apply to our situation because we're talking about mostly about drugs. <clears throat> but again, my, my perception of photographs, so the use, the value of photographs, applies more to sanitation issues, about uh, poor housekeeping, about rodent infestation, about dirty equipment. Now that can be used, that certainly can be used because that's certainly part of the GMPs to maintain the, the uh, cleanliness of the equipment. Um, but you won't know, you, to answer your question, you won't know when the investigator or anybody else, it's not just the investigator because that that report, now we're talking about the establishment inspection report that contains those photographs. It's not the 483 because there will be other people within FDA that review that establishment inspection report. So those pictures are taken uh, not only for the investigator to document whatever the investigator th saw, but also to demonstrate to people, other people in the district office or headquarters or the, or the center or the office of compliance. Uh, so you won't really, you may never know uh, what import or how important the um, the agency thought those pictures were, particularly the investigator. So if I know and uh, he or she took seven pictures and then when I received the EIR, he used only five and may I question the FDA and what happened to the two no pictures and how can I measure and these pictures are safe and not release it to the public? Well, there are a couple of different issues there. I, I, I would be extremely surprised if the investigator took seven photographs and only five showed up in the EIR. Uh, at a minimum, if that were done, at a minimum there would have to be some explanation. Uh, I think all of those photographs would be, would be available. Okay, and it's a related uh, one, and not, not a photograph, that's about the EIR. And we have an inspe uh, inspection, and then after a while, and we didn't receive the EIR, and then we call FDA, and the SIA, we have not received the EIR yet. And the uh, investigator has left the FDA, and then this inspection needs to be disqualified, and then we need to reschedule uh, the inspection. And theoretically, I, I tried to refuse the inspection because I'm just a, a few months ago. And however, and our CMO and didn't feel very comfortable and to refuse uh, the, the FDA inspection. And so we just said, let them go. And legally, can I, can I refuse the in, 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 uh, inspection or not? Um, as a general principle, it's it's not a, not a good idea to uh, openly refuse an inspection. Uh, I'm not sure I, I fully understood the situation that you described. You, what well, well, that's the inspection finished, but uh, the ins uh, somehow the EIR is lost in the uh, in, okay. in uh, either FDA or the investigator, and the investigator is left. Well, if the was the, was there a request made for a copy of the EIR? Well, then when the inspection is finished and we should receive a cover letter with an EIR for an international uh, facility. Well, even in situations where firms are entitled to receive the EIR in due course after an inspection, that doesn't always happen. And what that is sometimes uh, is a reflection of uh, the attention to which the investigator or somebody in the district office pays to the follow-up. Uh, on the inspection. If that happens, 
I would suggest that um, it would, a letter to the to the FDA, to the district office, for example, would be appropriate to request a copy of the establishment inspection report. And the firm, if the firm has not been classified or the inspection not been classified official action, they should be entitled to receive a copy of that establishment yeah, that's inspection what report. That's what I, I did. I request for a cup letter and EIR and the FDA told me and this inspection is disqualified because and there's no EIR yet. Well, that tells me, I'm inferring from this, that that tells me that the investigator has not written the EIR. Somehow. It's not. That happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. So one second letter might not be out of order either. Well, we didn't have a problem because and I, we, I, I were confident that and then it will pass. But I just wonder legally whether I can refuse <laughs> because and it's not our fault, it's their fault. <laughs> well, you can always ask again. You can always ask again. If you don't, ans if you don't ask, the answer is no. So, so try again maybe with another letter. I, I, I mean, definitely you will not be able to get anything from FDA because and they, they said it's disqualified. They don't have, okay. they don't have, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're a lawyer, right? You're the lawyer, and, and so if I refused, and then we'll, we'll have any sub subsequent and from FDA say, hey, hey, you refused to have an inspection because and this has been, inspection has been done already. Well, <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you on that. That's, that's a difficult situation, but it wouldn't hurt to ask. Okay, um, documentation. Um, the investigators are there to gather information uh, to show any violations of the, st of the statute or the regulations. Um, and what we talked before the break about FDA putting together a packet of information that they send forward for review. And these are some of the things that are included in that uh, packet of information. The 483s and responses, the EIRs, any warning letters or untitled letters um, and the responses to those, any other correspondences to or from uh, FDA. Sometimes FDA will send letters saying that the responses are inadequate, uh, try again, um, and uh, other communications that you might have um, from FDA, including phone calls. Uh, okay, after the inspection. Uh, is, yes, there's a question here. I have a question regarding the difference in between the untitled letter and the and the warning letter because I experienced with a customer that uh, the facility was inspected by the FDA. Then we received an untitled letter with many observations. And then we started to make a proposal how to solve, but was never any title, anything, just a letter without date and without title regarding the inspection. What does this mean? So if I understand correctly, the, the firm received a letter that did not have the words warning letter on it. It was just a letter. Uh, it's, and did it, it commented on... It commented on the outcome of the inspection, and it brought to your to the firm's attention uh, potential deficiencies or po possible violations. Do you remember the length of time it was after the inspection and receiving the letter? One month. One month. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have a somewhat cynical personal opinion that sometimes the untitled letters are just stale warning letters, and it took FDA a long time to get it out. In your, in your situation, um, with it being one month, it could very well be that the agency wanted to bring something to the attention of the firm, but it didn't rise to the level uh, of a warning letter. Now, there could also be 101 other reasons behind the scenes that that occurred, that that letter was sent the way it was, that we'll never, that we'll never know. Um, my personal philosophy is to treat an untitled letter the same as a warning letter. Yeah, because that uh, the FDA doesn't send those just because they're looking for something to do to send a letter. <laughs> but 
it's also another notice. Remember, remember this, is, this is a really important takeaway. The 43 is not just, not just a, a, an isolated document that uh, reports observations made by the investigator. The warning letter is another form of notice. An untitled letter is another form of notice. And what happens is, well, we were t talking just a f couple of minutes ago about FDA putting together its, its packet of information that it uses to send forward to support, for example, an enforcement action. They will include those types of documents and the responses. And I have seen pleadings, for example, a complaint for injunction that oftentimes leads to a consent decree. You can use those two words interchangeably. A consent decree just means that the firm agrees to an injunction. Uh, but all of that information then sometimes gets recited in the com complaint for injunction, which becomes a public record when it's filed in federal court. And the FDA is extremely good about documenting its warnings and its notices to industry. And in that publicly available complaint for injunction, it will read a little bit of the regulatory history. The firm was inspected on this date between these days and this days, inspected again, inspected again. The firm was issued a warning letter on such and such a date. The firm was issued an untitled letter on such and such a date. And then the conclusion that they want the federal judge to draw from that is in spite of all of these notices and warnings, the 483, the untitled letter, the warning letter, they still didn't do what they were told that they were not doing. And therefore, judge, because they didn't get it from these other communications from FDA, we want you as a federal judge to enter an order of injunction against this firm, telling them what they should do and what they should not do. That's part of the value of these documents. And that, and that is the <clears throat> these documents are very carefully crafted uh, and very precise, and they go through a lot of review. So those letters, the, it, untitled or warning letter, however it's titled, uh, those should be taken very seriously. It sounds like you did the right thing there. Yeah. Okay, uh, we know there's no statutory requirement. I think sometimes I've seen recently documents where FDA refers to the responses as voluntary or unsolicited responses to the 483s. Um, there's, this is kind of a little a pet expression that I have, and I kind of picked it up when I was working on the same side of the table as with FDA, and their, their common phrase or frequently used phrase is, they, they, meaning the firm, the firm either doesn't know or they don't care. And in either situation, in FDA's eyes, that's not an acceptable conclusion to be drawn. Now, that may not be fair, but that is sometimes how FDA looks at non-response. And I have seen that, or I have seen responses. The only, the only way that, I'm, one that I'm thinking of in particular, the only way that the response could have been written more poorly was that it had been written in like one of these first grade pencils or a crayon. It was just horrible. The person did not see the train coming at all. Um, so that's a, they, um, they pay attention to the, to the responses. Uh, in August of 2009, you probably all know, did, we have a, did you have a question or you just? Um, FDA um, uh, published a notice in the Federal Register and they said, uh, in essence, that because in, uh, historically, because of the delays caused by repeated and delayed submissions of responses to 483s, um, they were changing their policy on issuing warning letters, on the timing of issuing warning letters. Now that took away, from our side of the table, that took away a little bit of a, of a, of a tactic that I know some people have used sometimes, that, that you submit a response and if that doesn't quite do it, then you submit another response or you try to look for ways to try to delay FDA's process of issuing a warning letter. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, but now FDA's policy that was instituted in, in 2009 and then was on an interim basis and then it's been supposed to be renewed, renewed. I could not find anything where it's renewed in talking with people. Um, I think it's pretty much a de facto thing. It is the 15 days is here to stay. Um, and it's 15 business days, and the investigators, I was recently in a closeout uh, meeting um, where the investigators specifically mentioned to the owner and person in charge 
that they had 15 days to respond to the 483. So that's within the last month. So this is still current, and I'm sure that you've probably found the same. So the 15 days is 15 days within which FDA can um, submit its recommendation to headquarters for the issuance of a warning letter. And this is what I was just talking about, the delays in the response in issuing the warning letters. Now this program that FDA has, if the response is submitted within 15 days and FDA decides to um, recommend and issue a warning letter, there will at least be, a, in their words, detailed review by FDA before the warning letter, letter decision. And if a warning letter is issued, then FDA will acknowledge receipt of the responses within the 15 business day time frame and comment um, on the adequacy of the corrective actions that were offered in the response to the 483. There's a question here. Yeah, I just want to make a comment on that 15 uh, business days. That's from our um, experience, that's 15 business days is in the eyes of the FDA. Um, we had a, a foreign site inspection, and the week after that two-week inspection, there was a two-day federal holiday for that particular country. And the FDA said, well, those count as business days because the FDA is operational. So if you have foreign um, establishments and this comes up, you may want to clarify with your inspector. But in this case, the inspector was going based on U.S federal working days so good point thank you for making that point uh, so basically you're saying that we're not required to respond to the 483 however we can be cited for not responding to the 483 well you might you might be recited what i'm saying is that there's no there's no legal obligation there's no there's nothing in the statute or the regulations that says a firm that receives a 483 must respond and it's been common practice in the industries for decades that you don't leave a, a 483 unanswered. But would an uh, answer of we've received your observations and have acknowledged your observations and we are attempting for corrective action instead of addressing each one of the observations and having a corrective action for each one included in the response, would that suffice as well in avoiding a warning letter if you had no criticals? You know, that's a, that's a really good question, and I, I, don't know, um, I don't know what FDA would do with that because there are some people who are of the opinion, because 15 business days, you, if you get a whopper of a 483, 15 business days is a very short period of time to get a response together, to get a decent response together. I think it can be done in stages. I think you can do it with, with commitments. Uh, that may or may not be enough to carry the day, it, depending on how it depends, back to your answer earlier in the day, it depends upon the observations, depends upon how serious those observations were. For example, if you have sterile products, if you have a sterility issue on a product, that... Inadequate validation. Right. You're not going to pull a validation off in 15 days. No way. No way. Uh, however, I think it's worth a try to say that the, the validation, that there a validation... Uh, protocol is being written or has been written mm -hmm. and the protocol or the validation will be started on or before such and such a date. So your recommendation is to respond to each one of the observations instead of overall saying thank you for giving oh, us this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, and we'll get back right. to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> More to follow? No. No. Try to do it as completely as, and as detailed as you can and it's I think it's it's pretty much standard practice to do observation response observation response and then included in the response is some reasonable time frame and one of the things that validation is a very good example validations i don't know why well we all know why take longer than anybody ever expects sometimes you can't you know if you get an inspection on the first of october or get a 483 on the first of october and you think you're going to validate a process by september or november 1st it's not going to happen, so it, it has to be. It has to be realistic. I'm sorry. Yes, right, and then we'll we'll touch on that in a in a minute. Um, it, but this is and the, the the slide covers this, and it it it, it um, uh, 15 days after the inspection, the district office has to refer 
their recommendation for a warning letter to the, to the center, to headquarters. And then headquarters has 15 days to notify the district office of their decision if they turn it down. And then if the center turns it down, they've got 30 days to notify the district office or to give the district office a memorandum why they turned down the, the warning letter. But what, it, what I've read in the procedures for handling warning letters, you know, in the regulatory procedures manual, is there seems to be a, uh, an absence of any deadline for FDA if they tell the district office that they have approved a warning letter there doesn't seem to be any time limit for headquarters to obtain what they refer to as review and concurrence. So that's kind of open-ended uh, from that point of view. And that's where, in a conversation I had with a district director not too long ago, I asked about this question. And they, <clears throat> I was told that they try internally, and I've not seen anything in writing on this, but they try internally to get the warning letter turnaround within four months. If it's longer than four months, for example, like six months, that's why I asked about the length of time before in the inspection, um, they turn it into an untitled letter. Not always, but that's kind of what happens sometimes. So their kind of rule of thumb is, is four months to get a turnaround on a warning letter. Now we've all seen warning letters that have been issued much beyond that four month period of time. Okay, I guess this might be a little bit like uh, preaching to the believers here, um, but when getting the, um, the 483 to, to read it and make sure that it's understood, and, and sometimes when I look at these and, and have been asked to participate in responding, um, I have to read it two or three times sometimes, or maybe even more to understand it. Contrary to the instructions given to the investigators in the inspections operations manual that they're supposed to write clear and succinct and all of that sort of thing, sometimes those observations are a little bit difficult to follow. Uh, and that's perhaps the value of, of the conversation during the closeout meeting, um, the meeting with management, or during the course of the inspection. I know it's easy to say now, sitting here in this room, that it's, it's a great idea, you can intellectualize it when you're right there during the course of the inspection and there's a lot going on. You don't always think of everything at that time and the meaning of the, of the, of the observation doesn't become clear sometimes until it's, you read it at a quieter moment. So, but try to understand the FDA's concerns, um, identify each issue, to back to your, to your point. Uh, if you've got people um, in the facility um, that have particular expertise, get them involved if they haven't already been involved during the course of the inspection. Um, the last two points on here, the scope of the observation and the systemic uh, perspective. How big of a problem or how big of an observation is this? How big of, how big of an issue? Is it just a kind of a minor one-off sort of thing and it just happened? Um, or is there some practice or procedure that needs to be addressed? Are there other, not only uh, other lots of the same product, but could be other manufacturing processes affected by the same um, observation that the investigator found. Uh, again, these are kind of related system-wide implications as well as global Im implications. You see more and more comments um, in warning letters in recent years about looking at a systemic approach, looking at a global approach, and I've got a couple examples of some warning letters here where that point is, is very well made. Uh, certainly root cause analysis, um, FDA is always interested in that. Why did the wheels fall off the wagon and what's going to happen? What's the firm going to do to prevent those wheels from falling off again? And again, keep in mind too that there could be a warning letter, could be a recall. Um, one way that I've heard uh, the agency uh, indirectly suggest that there be a recall was when they ask, what do you intend to do about the product that's still on the market? What do you intend to do about the lots before and the lots after this affected lot? So anticipate that, and if you can, find a way to justify the continued marketing of the product. Maybe, it, maybe you can isolate a, a lot or two. Um, this, is more of a, this part is more of a strategic approach uh, to, to determine whether you need immediate, midterm, or long-term um, corrective and preventive action plans. And who's going to 
who's going to be in charge of that? Do you have the expertise within house? Do you need somebody or some ones from outside? Um, there should be some some leaders. If the product, if the project is can, is divisible, maybe certain people can be um, assigned certain areas, certain subject areas, and then have maybe perhaps have someone overall that's responsible for cracking the whip and making sure that that the project gets done and gets done on time. And if there's any follow-up that's needed, that the follow-up uh, takes place. Um, Responding to a 483 and or a warning letter, I think, is a, is a very important um, opportunity for firms to demonstrate their knowledge of their business, their knowledge of their manufacturing operations. And I, I believe that in most cases, uh, almost all the cases, that the people in industry know more about the manufacturing process than the investigators. Now, there might be some exceptions where you've got some very good seasoned investigators. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for, the, for a firm to showcase what they know and how they can, can demonstrate that they are in control of their business. And um, this is the, the response to the, to the 483s, I think, is a good way to do that. And it also demonstrates that the firm gets it, that the firm is in the process of taking corrective actions, that the firm knows what to do, that the, the firm is in control of its own operations. Um, and there's also the benefit, too, that it, you might dodge a bullet and uh, avoid some, some additional uh, regulatory action. Um, the response, pretty straightforward, easy, easy said here, right? Um, factual, complete, demonstrate that the firm and the people there understand the issues, and again, that they're in, uh, in control. Documentation, if you have documentation, lab reports, um, stability studies, things of that nature that will support the position. Um, and here, I put in here easy to read and um, item by item responses, and not to mention the realistic, but in a way, um, a response to a 483 and a warning letter is sort of telling a story. You're telling your story. The investigator comes in and says, this isn't right, that isn't right, but it gives the firm then an opportunity to say, well, maybe there's a misperception here. Maybe you might be right. At the time that you saw this, this wasn't quite the way it was. But this is, this is the whole overall scheme of things, and this is the whole overall picture to show that we are operating in control and know what we're doing, and here's the evidence to show why we know what we're doing. Um, Someone at this table mentioned about the, the reasonable and realistic timelines, and you did also. It's, that's extremely important. I've seen responses where I, I don't know where, where the dates come from sometimes. It's just terribly short. Um, and I think that FDA is willing to accept um, with, some, with some reserve, but I think FDA is willing to accept an estimated date. If a firm gives FDA an, uh, an estimated com project completion date, they're going to look for the firm to have completed that project by that, by that date. Now, that doesn't mean that if there's a, a, an estimated completion date given and something happens, there's a delay of some kind, that doesn't mean that that date can't be reset. The date can be reset, but you have to let the district office know. You have to let FDA know. Don't go silent. Maintain that dialogue that you develop during the course of the inspection. Maintain that dialogue after the inspection. Maybe there's one person in the, in the firm that can be the conduit, that can be the, the, the face, either do it orally or uh, in writing. And I would suggest that you, kind of, you do it both ways. You test the water with a phone call and then um, follow it up with a letter. There's a question here. So whom, whom would I call? So I, I'm not in contact with investigator anymore, right? So I have no name, I have just an address, no Well, you're, you'd be a foreign establishment inspection, yes. correct? Um, then you would, you would want to find out who the person was at FDA headquarters that was monitoring. Kind of. I simply just don't know what to do. I sent my response. I never hear, hear back. So where do we stand? Well, a good place to start, if, if, did you send the response to a specific individual? No. The, the 483 gave an, gave an address? It was supposed to be sent there. Also, and the investigator told me to send the response right. to that address, and it didn't have a name. Okay, I hear. I, I, I hear some. Perhaps somebody in the back has got some, some 
similar experiences with this. May I, may I share my experience? Yes, please. I, I normally I try to follow up when I send the 483 response to the FDA, I also send an email. And after a while, if I need to follow up, I just follow up that email and say, hey, I sent this in. I just want to check whether you received that and whether the review has been done or not. And because I have not received any response from you yet. And I also normally I get the business card from the investigator, the investigator, and I will follow up and say, hey, thank you for coming to inspect our facility. And after a while, and I say, hey, I we have not received any response from FDA. I just wonder whether you have signed in your EIR, got time to sign your EIR in yet, something like that. Normally, that response. Right. That is one pretty well. All right. That certainly would be one way of doing it. It's certainly, if you get the card, if you get a copy of the card, the business card from the investigator, then you have a specific person uh, that you can contact. Uh, Right. Well, no, oftentimes they come, right, because headquarters uh, uh, supervises all of the foreign inspections and they bring investigators in from different district offices. And you might get lucky, you might have a conscientious investigator that might uh, reach out and, and do something about it. But, yeah. For us, being in Europe was quite difficult to get in contact with them. After we received the letter, the untitled letter, we sent the response in what we did at the end because it was a little bit anxious for all the organization to not be able to hear from them. We contact one consultant uh, company in the States and they started to do the communication back until they get back to us because it was impossible for us. We did whatever thing to get in contact with them, mm -hmm. to get feedback, to interact and no, 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 no was impossible. Well, and, and, and that's the communication is, um, is further complicated by the time difference between, for example, in your case, Europe and the United States, it's six to seven hours sometimes. We have a lot of communication for our 510Ks, for example, so I'm, I'm in, in medical devices. So typically there is no problem to talk to the FDA, but for, for a three and inspections, we simply don't know whom to contact. If anybody knows, just let me know. Okay. Please do. I'll see if I can get you an answer to that. It's like yelling into a well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You're not alone. You're not alone. All right. Uh, the responses include the corrective actions accomplished or planned. Uh, again, uh, I know it sounds like a broken record, but um, be realistic about the completion dates. Um, and again, keep the district office or whatever office is monitoring this uh, informed uh, of the progress because sometimes dates do slip and that's, that's normal. But they need to know that so that they've got some, some reasonable expectation uh, of the firm. Just a quick question. Um, I know a lot of sites do this internally for their CAPAs, but a more robust CAPA process now includes and uh, uh, effectiveness checks, and you know setting criteria for success of how they'll deem what uh, if the corrective action is successful. Have you seen anyone doing that and adding those uh, effectiveness checks within the response? Or will they ever start looking for that? Because they'll audit that, but I have never actually seen it on a, a you know, FDA, uh, like a 4083 yeah. response. I, I haven't. Uh, and what do you do with those? You're saying your firm is doing that? You're doing those internal? Yeah, I mean, it's part of our, the, you know, the CAP program where when you set up the criteria, you know, the, the actual corrective action, you have due dates and the action set, but then you set. Uh, a time limit. In six months, we'll do this step and this step to make sure that it, th the corrective action has been implemented and or is it su successful. So it's just a trigger at the very end. And I, I've seen a lot of uh, you know, inspectors now looking for those effectiveness checks because it's like, okay, I did it and then I forget about it. That's not good enough nowadays. But I didn't, I've well, never seen it in a response yet. I don't know if they'll ever ask for it. Um, I've not either, but uh, given the explanation that you just gave, the description, uh, it, it, it's possible that it might, that there might have to be some 
some addressing of that if it shows up um, on a 483 in some way. That's a possibility, yeah. Uh, okay, keep the district office informed. Um, I, I thought maybe some examples of um, responses to 483s and warning letters that FDA found inadequate. So these are the replies um, that FDA has made to certain responses. Um, and they're all in the handouts here. But um, here FDA is unhappy with spot fixes and failed to achieve the systemic approach of the uh, observations. Um, acknowledge receipt of it, of the, of the response, plus four responses over an eight-month period of time. Um, don't consider your responses to be adequate because of the following. Uh, the, a letter like this or a situation like this probably is part of why FDA has gone to the 15-day rule as far as responses. Um, this is interesting. There was a warning letter issued in 2006, and the firm um, had some deficiencies there. And one of the things that they're talking, again, comprehensive corrections, but the firm offered in the response that they established a plan to complete the validation. These are validation of sterile products, sterile manufacturing. They were going to uh, complete the validation by the fourth quarter of 2008, and this is in 2006, so we're looking at two years, right? Now, here's the, here's, the, um, here's the interesting comment. Please indicate, talk about understatement. Please indicate your, uh, if you intend to ship any product that has been manufactured without a validated sterilization process. If so, then please identify the product and, and provide your justification for releasing such product. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, here's another one. Um, other batches. Your investigation failed to extend to other batches uh, of the same drug product and other drug products. Again, the systemic approach. That it's, is, it, is this a one-off, isolated situation, or does it have a larger impact? Um, you don't, uh, the firm did not acknowledge deficiencies in the investigation, or the failures. No additional information, so it's an inadequate response. There wasn't enough information that was there. Um, during the uh, significant observations here, our confidence in your investigative conclusion for sterility failures noted above is further weakened. Ouch. Uh, you don't address why you failed to take appropriate action at the time of the incidents and assess the scope of the problem and implement appropriate cor corrective action and to prevent recurrence. Again, that's the scope. That's the systemic versus non. This is um, an interesting letter. Um, we realize that you have multiple locations. Please, please make sure that you've evaluated all of those locations. That's the kind of, that, you can hear the cash register ringing on this one. You can feel the money flying out of the firm on a letter like this to address all of this. I've seen it happen. And it takes on a life of its own. It takes on a life of its own. Here's another corporate warning letter. Uh, we request a prompt meeting with you. You should come prepared to discuss your current corporate strategy to bring all of your facilities into compliance and come prepared to discuss the recent recalls and your ongoing corporate efforts to prevent recurrence of these violations. That's not a friendly, come on and have, let's have a cup of coffee letter. Here, back to the comments that I've made repeatedly earlier. The purpose of this letter, that's right out here in black and white. The purpose of this letter is to advise top management of your inadequate corporate-wide corrective action plan as evidenced by the continuing serious deficiencies. FDA is extremely good about documenting its position and noting um, violations. Um, this is kind of a, a list here, uh, no, nothing fancy about it. Common mistakes about responding, not responding, rushing. I've seen situations where, uh, this was be before the 15 days, um, rushing to get a response in, then it was 30 days. Um, and then the firm, after that, ended up submitting two or three or, four or more responses after that initial response. Um, 
Now with the 15-day rule in place, it's a little bit it's a little bit more challenging to get something in. But I think a good strategy is to always keep the district office or the office that you're working with involved to let them know what's going on, so that they so that they um, don't think that the firm has forgotten about it, uh, the 483, or is ignoring the the consequences of the 483. Uh, again, these, you can read these as being defensive, uh, demonstrating a lack of understanding. Blanket admissions here, this, this item is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. I've seen presentations given by, and I've spoken with people at FDA in the compliance position. Um, they have, <clears throat> they would like for firms, and I'm not quite sure why. I don't think it's out of any sort of sinister attitude, but they would like for firms to admit, to acknowledge, that there are some deficiencies there. It, it's um, sort of like repenting of your sins, I suppose. But um, I don't. Ag I don't agree with that philosophy. Um, I don't. I, you, you don't have to necessarily become argumentative with them and tell them that they're that they're uh, all wet on an observation. But I look at it from a from a legal point of view that there could be other ramifications outside the regulatory arena, such as products liability. If a person, if a firm gets a 483 and the firm responds that they admit that their sterility, um, the, the um, sterility process for the aseptic fill, for example, has not been validated, um, and somebody then is injured as a result of uh, being injected with one of those products, there's some potential ramifications to that in another arena. That becomes an admission by the, by the firm. And again, you have to be careful with this. I'm not suggesting that you be argumentative or uh, you know, openly uh, antagonistic with FDA. I'm just expressing my difference of opinion with some people at FDA that think that there should be a statement that the firm accepts the observation as it was given and admits to its accuracy. I, I, I'm very cautious about stuff like that. Um, and again, disagreeing with FDA, uh, they've got a tremendous advantage. Um, it's, uh, sometimes it's almost like tilting windmills. But you can do it, and you should do it, uh, if, if you've got science and data to support the position. Uh, you can also do it in situations when you've got a little bit of science or data. Uh, if there are um, uh, medical necessity issues involved with, with products. If you have a manufacturer that is manufactures is the only manufacturer or one of two manufacturers that manufactures medically necessary products, um, that might <clears throat> provide some negotiating uh, uh, leverage, if you will. Uh, no public health risk. There's no danger to the public consuming the product, uh, and it's a, there's a low uh, risk assessment. I know, for example, to go back to the idea of uh, medical necessity, there, um, uh, there have been situations where FDA has filed and obtained consent decrees of permanent injunction against firms, and yet when they, after they laid out their list of horribles as, as to why these products were so violative uh, and the company should not be allowed to uh, manufacture and distribute those products, there's a, been a carve out of certain products that were medically necessary, even though, you know, isn't this a little bit ironic? The product, these products are not GMP compliant, but you can still market them. There's just always been that inconsistency there. So it's, um, I don't think it's capable of being rationalized. Uh, checklist here, you know, my suggestion is respond demonstrates that the company knows what's going on and, and that they are in control of, of the uh, operations. It kind of gives you a, a, a way to, to show what you do know. Um, take ownership, do your root cause analyses, um, discuss the corrective and preventive action plans in detail as best you can at the time. You may have to supplement the response, that's okay. Um, and again, broken record, realistic commitments and, and milestones. Um, and if you disagree, make sure you have some science and facts on your side to do it. You just can't disagree based upon um, opinion because um, that's, FDA won't accept that. And it, it, it stresses the relationship. Well, I just... There, okay, this one. Don't. No inadequate responses, defensive, again, one of my favorites, no blanket admissions. 
Don't guess at the root cause. Back to the science and the facts if you've got them. And use them to the fullest extent possible. And failing to meet commitments, um, that's, you've heard that before. That's, I think that's extremely important. Uh, same thing with don't, try not to miss the timelines, or at least do your best to keep the FDA and the district office you're working with uh, informed. So this is part of the program. Can we take, ooh, we've got 10 minutes left. Let me grab the hypothetical. We'll go through as much of it. If you want to leave, everybody wants to leave it for, I'm happy to stay beyond that. Um, if you want to do the hypothetical. Um, we've got a, um, a firm here called Big Time Drugs, and um, an investigator shows up for an inspection. He meets with the receptionist, and then he's introduced to Mr. Newton, who just came from a food company to a drug manufacturing firm. And he thought he'd be able to use his science in uh, the pharmaceutical industry, a level job. Now, here's the, here's the person who meets the investigator. Um, anything, anything that comes to mind just in those first two paragraphs, I'll kind of jump to the bottom line. There was no present, presentation of the credentials or the issuance of the uh, notice of inspection. So technically, technically, what proceeds from that point is invalid. It's not a valid inspection. Because the this, this statute says, upon presenting credentials and issuing a notice. So, and this is something that's drilled into the heads of the investigators. So this is maybe an unlikely situation. But without a presentation of the credentials and the issuing of a notice of inspection, and that is an example of a notice of inspection that is part of the handouts here that is form FDA 482. And it's a two, here it's a two, three page document. Um, you might want to take a few minutes and, and read the document because it does explain the authority for FDA to be there and to conduct the inspection. And every inspection begins with the issuance of the 482 after the investigator shows their credentials. And I'm sure you've all seen that, um, that situation. Um, so Newton says, well, you, where's your warrant? And the investigator says, no warrant's necessary. Well, we know that no, that no warrant uh, is necessary. Um, let me jump ahead a little bit to the what the fourth paragraph there. So, um, Bonnie Beckman was the is the person who was the, you know, the regulatory affairs uh, uh, director, and she was delayed. So Newton asks the investigator to cool his heels in the waiting room for a while until Miss Beckman comes, and she was delayed quite a few hours until because of some traffic situations doesn't get there until some hours later. Think about the situation now with the issuance of this draft guidance um, that came out in, in July. Uh, and one of the specific examples that is in that draft guidance of asking that the inspection not begin until certain specific employees are present. Any thoughts on what you think FDA might Think about that. I suppose it depends upon the length of time and the circumstances. But be aware of that. Um, be aware of that. Also, um, something that comes to mind, too, when the investigator introduced himself to the receptionist, there should be some sort of a phone tree that kicks into play, that the alarm bell goes off in a silent way and people are alerted and there should be um, people available. Certainly, if Ms. Beckman wasn't there, there should have been somebody else as a, as a backup um, because the, this is the start of the inspection. Um, if the inspection starts bad, is it reasonable to expect that it's going to get better? 
So, um, so asking an investigator to wait uh, is probably not uh, a good idea and to be able to get started uh, as, as quickly as possible. But you know what, um, given the time, um, read the hypothetical if you have a chance, but we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to be able to have people exchange their thoughts or to ask questions uh, about the inspectional process or about uh, FDA and what FDA is thinking or doing or angels on the head of a pin, as it may be. We have a comment here. I have a question about complaint reporting. Um, recently, with an inspection that we had, the investigator came in and asked for documentation of a complaint that was reported on the VAERS database, V-A-E-R-S, mm -hmm. which is, according to the FDA's website, it is non-governed. It is for anybody and their mom to go ahead and report any adverse events for vaccines. So they completely stayed on there that it's not at all official. However, we were held accountable through our complaint system on this VAERS database. Have you heard anything about this, this type of a database and our obligation to respond to every report on there if it's not made through official channels? Um, not about that specific point, but do you monitor that? Does your firm monitor that? We do now. <laughs> <laughs> I think FDA is is in, is inclined to take the position that um, that firms are responsible for doing that sort of thing, and that information that comes to them pretty much from whatever source um, is deserving of an investigation. Any other questions or comments? You have I have a different question regarding fail, failure to meet commitments. So often we have inspection maybe every other year or so, so commitment from prior years being communicated to the agency. Now what is the agency's resource in monitoring the completion of these commitments? Definitely it is a trust level between the agency and the firm, and it is, it is the it is, is it the firm's obligation also to update the agency if you have moved your timeline or delay in your commitment completions? Are you talking about um, modifying Respond. the time, the completion date for a, a promised uh, corrective action? Correct. From your initial commitment and would the agency come back and monitor and how do they monitor or until the next inspections come, the next inspection with the different inspectors to come up to follow, hey, what happened to the last inspection commitment. My personal opinion is it's always a good idea to um, keep FDA updated. If you've given a date, a commitment date, and something happens that causes you, the firm, to have to change that date, that the agency, it's best to notify the agency of that revised date with some short explanation uh, supporting why that, that date has changed. My Suspicion is that then FDA would, when well, next time they inspect, they'll verify whether that corrective action has been completed. Right. We've also have inspection that the current inspector didn't get to verify what happened from the last inspection commitment. So I, I, I don't know how everybody feels in the, the the audience here, what their experience has been. So it's been not consistent. Right. Is that true? Um, well? I think, yes, I don't think you're alone in that. And I think that that just goes back to the fact that it's an unvalidated process. Whether um, they have resources or they have a process to monitor how firms complete their um, commitments? I think, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I think uh, part of it is human error. Um, that the investigators may not be preparing for the reinspection as well as they should. Or you have a different inspector investigator that's that's there that prepares in a different way. Okay. Thank you. As I read this guidance, a lot of this is very subjective. Uh, for instance, let's say we've never no, I never experienced an FDA inspection and we'd like to have our attorney present. 
Is it unreasonable to say, and, and the FDA walks in unannounced? Right, as they most always do. Is it reasonable to say, I would like you to wait until my attorney gets here, and oh, by the way, he's in court today, so come back tomorrow? Mm. Well, to me, that's reasonable, especially if I were the attorney. Um, I, don't think, I don't think you'd get a warm reception from the investigator. Um, you might get, um, let me try to um, imagine what, what their thought process would be from in that situation. Um, they'd probably want to know who the attorney was, if, what, if, what firm the attorney was associated with. And then they would say, they would ask, well, aren't there other lawyers in that firm? I think, that, I think in that specific situation that you described, I think you might have a, you might have a hard time being able to uh, persuade them to come back another day. Not saying they wouldn't. You might, you might find an investigator that would be amenable to doing that. But as a general principle, I don't, I don't think that would happen. But I don't, I've got no way of knowing. Keep an eye on that guidance document and what FDA is doing, because you might see some things in warning letters uh, in the future. Because that's, uh, and I, agree, I couldn't agree with you more about those um, those examples that FDA uh, cites for delaying, denying, limiting, or, or refusing inspections. I think they are very subjective. I also suspect, though I don't know, I suspect that those are probably examples that FDA has seen um, over the last however many years, and. Um, but they just didn't pull them out of thin air. So. Okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> we actually experienced a delay at one of our facilities. In the past, we used to require the FDA to go check in at the corporate location because we had two that were about five miles apart. So our typical response was, you need to go check in with the corporate office where all the um, – I guess the office folks and quality folks management work, and then we'll all come back to this facility. Uh, we learned that that was no longer acceptable, and it was because the 483 is very specific to that location. And if they were to go to another location, they would have to issue another 482. Excuse me, 42. So uh, what had another delay that we got was uh, we had she had open-toed shoes and was she was wearing heels which in our manufacturing facility is very unsafe. And typically we wear no slip shoes. And I think the reason that she did it was, I guess, to, I don't know, if it felt like she was trying us a little bit uh, to see if we would let her in. When we didn't want to let her in and wanted her to get other shoes, she became very angry and got very defensive. What are you hiding? What are you doing in there? And none of the management had gotten over in that time frame, because uh, it took us, you know, a little while to get notified that they were there. Finally, when we did get over there, we were able to, you know, apologize profusely for all of the misunderstanding and try to tell them that we didn't typically uh, do our inspections this way, and we were able to smooth it over with the relationship. And the next day, everything went much smoother. It was like a whole nother day. And we were able to, you know, kind of turn it around. We became very open and forthcoming as soon as she was settled in. But that first day was very kind of tough to get over. And it was mentioned in our EIR inspection, the little, a little bit of a blurb about kind of what happened. But she did indicate that, you know, we turned it all around by being very open and building that relationship. So you can get by it and... I'm not surprised that the draft came out after that because it was coming up. I have a question. Do you have any idea how long that individual was an FDA investigator? Uh, no, I don't. But she did have a trainee with her. So I, it was obvious that she w the person that she was with was very new and that they were in training and that she was the more senior inspector and she did a few things that made us indicate that she was you know kind of 
showing, well, this is kind of how it's supposed to go, and I do have the authority, and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of. So she may have been playing to another audience there, too. A little the, bit, a little bit. Yeah. But, I, I mean, we were able to turn it around, so it didn't turn into an issue of delay, uh, but it was very clear, and we changed our policy after that very quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to come in and sit down and, have a conference room sure. very quickly. Well, the reason I asked about if you had any idea how long that person might have been an investigator, uh, it's been my experience that sometimes um, scenes like that happen with newer investigators, the people that are, they know something, they're not as experienced as others, and there's a little bit of insecurity there, so they become a little defensive and therefore a little bit more assertive. Uh, that that sometimes happens, and that's difficult to deal with. I thought, it sounds like you did a great job handling it. <laughs> have a comment here oh, excuse, one more just a second. and maybe just to follow on 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 that uh, on that story it sounds like what what turned it around was really highlighting to the inspectors you're being open and honest and transparent and that's maybe the one thing i think we we've, we've talked about this afternoon you know what what sets us up for success is the tone from the top and getting the inspector to uh hopefully set aside their suspicions and give you the benefit of the doubt because everything that they're asking for you're either able to provide or you've got the resources to give them the explanations they're looking for so it's so true Um, this gentleman over here earlier in the afternoon talked about relationships Um, I've mentioned similar things in the afternoon other people have commented about it Um, it, it, each inspection is so individualized um, and it and it can turn it can turn on a without notice uh, very abruptly sometimes, and you some you don't know why sometimes. So it's uh, again, it's it's extremely important I think to have the appropriate people uh, act as escorts and to be able to interface with the people from the Food and Drug Administration to instill in them that confidence that you as a group of people in a firm you are in control of your operations, you've got nothing to hide. Once, once, that, once that scent, if you will, of suspicion leaks out, uh, that can color the, the whole inspection, no matter what happens. And um, then sometimes the investigators think they're off for the crime of the century and they're going to they're gonna get it. So, and sometimes it's only in their minds. But it's a... It's, it's a it can be a very delicate, challenging process sometimes. And I think there's a certain, um, there's a certain amount of inherent um, suspicion of industry just as a starter. Uh, and that's, that's something that we all have to, to deal with. But um, thank you all for coming and for your participation. I think it was a good afternoon. I appreciated uh, all of your comments and look forward to talking with you some more. Have a good afternoon.